Hello, everybody. Welcome back to a brand new episode of The Casual Criminalist. As always, I'm your host, Simon. My name is one of my writers, in this case, Emma. Thank you, Emma's written me a script. How a podcast, ooh, like this one. I mean, not this one. We didn't find justice for Kristen Smart, but a podcast did. So let's find out about it. I've never read this before. That's the format of the show. We're going to learn about it together. Let's jump in. In television or in interviews, you'll sometimes hear a person ask another, do you have kids? And I always thought that I understood the question. But now that I'm a mum myself, I've learned that you don't really understand the full scope of the question. Not really. Until you do actually have kids of your own. When someone asks you, do you have kids? They want to know if you understand their need to ensure that their babies are safe and happy and cared for. They want to know if you understand the lengths they'd go to to protect their children. And they want to know if you'd understand the never-ending heartbreak they feel because they don't know where their baby is. Um... Yeah. Also, I'll ask the question, like, do you have kids? Because I'm just interested. Do we have that in common? <laughs> do you want to talk some shit about kids? <laughs> You'd be like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I love them. But goddamn, sometimes. <laughs> I guess that's the difference between mums and dads. <laughs> it's like, mums. Do you have kids? Let's talk about how much we love them. Dads, do you want to talk? Let's talk about kids. <laughs> just complain. Like, I love my kids. But it's also like, oh, I'll definitely complain extensively <laughs> we've learned a lot of horrible parents on this channel but today we're going to learn about the lengths one family went to to protect their son and another decades-long search for their missing daughter the smart family stan and denise smart were both educators and have taught at schools all over the eastern coast for decades in february 1977 they were based at an american military base in augsburg germany and after months of struggling to fall pregnant the couple were looking to adopt a german boy but then denise did fall pregnant and they welcomed a dark-eyed blonde baby girl into the world who they named Kristin denise after having spent three years in germany they returned to the u.s and according to stan we had what everybody expects when you go to germany you come back with a volkswagen a cuckoo clock and a child <laughs> You do? Okay. Stan and Denise would later add two more children to their family, a son, Matthew, and another daughter named Lindsay. They were a typical middle-class American family. They went hiking on the weekends, went to the beach during the holidays, went on family cruises, and traveled all over the U.S. They moved to Stockton, California when Kristen was 11 and bought a house there. Sounds very nice. Sounds like nice like little life going on. <laughs> Sounds pretty chill. I like that. Go to the beach. Easy. The teenage Christian did well academically, was part of the swim team, played volleyball, and made friends easily. According to Stan, Christian participated in sports for the fun of it and didn't have the competitive spirit that her younger siblings had, but she still cheered them on from the sidelines. Christian loved to swim, spent hours in a room designing floor plans for houses, and traveled whenever possible. <laughs> that was a weird hobby that I had when I was a kid. Like, I'd draw like... I don't know if I wanted to be an architect or whatever, but I'd just happily be just drawing buildings, like with rulers, not like the outside. Just like the layout of buildings on like graph paper. It's kind of a weird thing to do, I guess. She spent a holiday in London with friends, spent a summer as an exchange student in Venezuela because she wanted to improve her Spanish, and learned to make omelettes the way the chefs did on cruise ships. Kind of weirdly specific. <laughs> What's that? It's a cruise ship omelette. What? So, so it's just an omelette. <laughs> okay. I've never been on a cruise, but is there some special thing about cruise ship omelettes? According to Anna Marie, one of her childhood friends, Kristen was smart and friendly, but quiet. She was also tall, measuring in at just over six feet. Wow, that is tall for a woman. And was self-conscious about it. As she grew older, Kristen adopted the bohemian or hippie look that was popular in the 90s, added little braids to her hair, and loved listening to Bob Marley, Tom Petty, and rap music. After graduating from Lincoln High School, Kristen worked as a lifeguard and a camp counselor at Camp Mokalea in Oahu, Hawaii. According to Rachel Bird, who shared a cabin with her for three months, Kristen was tall, beautiful, blonde, a surfer girl, like really chill. She was a sweet girl. She loved being out in the water. Anytime she could go and do search and rescue or anything like that, she wanted to be out there doing that. After spending three months working her dream dog, Kristen moved to San Luis Obispo in California in September 1995 and started attending the California Polytechnic State University, aka Cal Poly. According to Stan Smart, we thought that would be a good place for her. We thought it was a safe community, you know? And it is. It just didn't work out that way for our family. Kristen had originally signed up for a four-year architecture degree, but she would later switch to communications in the hope that she could become a journalist and realize her dream of traveling the world. 
Kristen wanted to be as financially independent as possible, so she signed up to work as a lifeguard to earn a little more cash and was required to swim for a certain amount of time every week to keep up her fitness levels. The only swimming slot available to a newbie was the 5 a.m. to 6 a.m. slot, so Kristen set her alarm for 4.20 every morning, swam for an hour, attended her classes, worked her lifeguard shifts, and then went back to her dorm in Muir Hall in the evenings. I really, I know she's going to be the one who gets into trouble in this episode, but I really like Kristen. She seems awesome. <laughs> Just before we continue, let me tell you that today's video is brought to you by Vessi. Have you ever faced an urban jungle on a rainy day, dodging puddles, struggling to keep your shoes dry, or more importantly, your socks dry inside the shoes? That's always what I had. And you know where you wear shoes for a while? And then it's, I don't know, like, I always wore like leather, leather shoes before. And it's like, you know, they last a little while, and then it's like, oh no, there's a little leak. <laughs> and then your socks get wet so easily. It's not nice. Vessies is the solution to that. Rain or shine, they've got you covered. Last time, I always told you how I like generally used clean Vessies on my thing, but people got a real kick out of seeing that I actually wore these because I, I was like, I always talk about having wearing these for years. I wore these ones for two years and now they're a little bit past it, but that's problems when you wear shoes every day for two years. But just to prove it, look at the bottom of that sole. <laughs> I really wore the hell out of these. And uh, I, I, I've basically worn nothing else. I think I mentioned I wore these to a funeral because honestly, I forgot my my nice like smart shoes. But uh, Vessies, they're just they're just everything to me. I don't wear anything else anymore. Why would I? Look, whatever you're doing, commuting to work, out and about on the weekends, Vessies will help you blend style, comfort, and waterproof protection. It's waterproof, by the way. It's not just water resistance. It uses this Dymatex material so that you can like, if you dip these into water up to here, totally fine, no worries. And I don't mean like into like rain into like, you could put these in a bath up to here. Nothing will happen. Your socks will be dry. They've also got their overcast jacket, which I don't have with me today because it wasn't raining. It was just freezing ass cold, but that's also amazing. So discover their latest collection at vessi.com forward slash TCC and get your pair today. Can't recommend it enough. Link below. And now back to today's video. But after a few months, Kristen admitted to her parents that she wasn't happy at Cal Poly. She complained that everyone on campus was the same, and she struggled to find her own identity. She dyed her naturally blonde hair brown, adopted various nicknames like Marisol, Roxy, Trixie, and Kiana, and signed her emails with the proscript, Live your life to be an exclamation rather than an explanation. Okie dokie then. According to Denise Smart, Kristen had piled too much on her plate and was struggling to keep up academically. By January 1996, Kristen was burned out and she begged her parents to allow her to move to a different university, preferably the University of the Virgin Islands or any of the universities in Puerto Rico, since she missed the happy go lucky life that she'd had in Hawaii. According to Stan, she wasn't always a happy camper. She wanted to go to another school. She wanted to travel more. She wanted to go to school overseas. She had all these grandiose ideas. At least they appeared to me that way at the time. It's okay though. She's what, like 20? She's allowed to like dream. I don't like, I don't know. I feel like, I don't know. I was a bit like this. <laughs> like, this is fine. You're young. In May 1996, Denise wrote Kristen a letter and explained to her daughter that she had all the opportunity she needed right at her fingertips. Freshman year was hard on everybody, and Denise suggested that Kristen should get her priorities in order and quit her work as a lifeguard so that she could focus on her studies. Her parents were willing and able to support her financially, and Denise told Kristen that once she had her degree, she could work on earning the big bucks. At the time, Kristen was worried that she would fail biology since one of her tests had been mislaid, but once it was found, Kristen learned that she had done well on the test and hasn't failed the semester. She called her parents at around 5pm on the 24th of May 1996, leaving a message on their answering machine and explaining that they'd found the test. She ended the call with a promise to, to call them that Sunday. Denise Smart recounts, She was very excited. She said, Hi, good news, good news. That was her good news. She had gotten a call from Professor whatever his name was. She had been trying for so long to get that resolved. It was a three-day Memorial Day weekend and the rest of the Smart family spent it at a swim meet where Matthew and Lindsay were competing. They had a scheduled family call with Kristen every Sunday night at 8pm, but that night Kristen didn't call like she'd promised. She also didn't call the next day or the day after that, and the Smart family found themselves at the threshold of a mystery that would haunt their family for the next 26 years. Oh, Kristen, I don't want you to disappear. You seem awesome. The Disappearance of Kristen Smart Margarita Campos was one of Kristen's neighbors in Moore Hall. She was very busy studying for a biology test when Kristen waltzed into her room that Friday night and asked to borrow a cassette player. Kristen used Margarita's double cassette player to create a mixtape for herself and eventually managed to convince Margarita that they had to go out and party that night. Margarita eventually agreed, and they joined up with two more girls who lived down the hall and had been invited to a private party. 
When they left Warhol at 8.30 that evening, Kristen was wearing a gray crop top, black Roxy Brands board shorts, and red Puma sneakers. She had nothing else on her and had lost her room key, so she depended on Margarita to let her back into Warhol. The four girls waved down a friend of theirs, and he took them to a house party in his truck. According to Margarita, they each received a beer when they arrived, and then stood around and watched as a bunch of guys play video games. It wasn't exactly the kind of party they were looking for, and after finishing their beers, Margarita and Kristen left. That night was such a chill night. It was such a quiet night in San Luis Obispo, and it was just like a couple of us driving around in a truck around town, and I'm pretty sure Kristen was the one who said, just drop Margarita and I off here, because we're going to just keep walking around. By 10 p.m., they still hadn't found a party, and Margarita was tired and needed to pee. She told Kristen that she wanted to go home. After debating a bit, Kristen was upset and finally told Margarita that she was going to continue looking for a party. Margarita handed Kristen her dorm key, said goodnight, and headed back to Moore Hall. I can still see her standing there after we dropped her off, a little mad that I wouldn't go with her. Someone who wasn't as independent as Kristen wouldn't have gone to a party alone. Yeah, I'd say that's pretty like... <laughs> I'd never do that, and I'm a dude. Like, not to say that women can't do the same things as dudes, but like, I don't know. Women are more vulnerable. And that's not sexist, is it? I worry about some stuff these days. But I'm just trying to say, like, I don't know. If my wife or I was out alone at night... Like, if my wife goes out to meet her mates and is coming back, I'd be more worried about her. And she says, like, I'm worried about you too. And it's like, yeah, but I'm less likely to get, you know... Guys, not, not you know, you know what I mean? You know what I mean? She kept saying, you go with me, but I didn't want to go. I told her, you better be careful... And she said she would be fine. Then she said bye. I was a Girl Scout for many years, and you're supposed to use the buddy system. And I was just tired that night. And she didn't come back. Not too long after the girls separated, Kristen made her way to 135 Crandall Way, otherwise known as the Crandall House, where a birthday party was being held for two seniors of the Kapakai House. Trevor Bolter was one of the 20 people who had been invited to the party, and when he arrived at around 10.15pm, there were maybe 15 people hanging out either inside the house or on the lawn out front. Later, there would be between 45 and 60 people at the party. When Trevor walked into the house, there were a handful of guys playing pool. People stood talking next to the bar. A few were dancing, and it wasn't long before a tall, dark-haired girl in a grey crop top and black board shorts drew Trevor's attention. According to Trevor, she walked up to him and introduced herself as Roxy. She kissed him, dragged him into the bathroom, and then dropped his hand. She explained that she had a crush on a basketball player who was also attending the party, and Trevor realized that she was just using him to make the guy jealous. She fixed her makeup, asked Trevor if he thought she was ugly, and then asked him who he thought she should go for, the basketball player or one of the other guys who lived in the house. When he offered his own services, Roxy laughed him off and then told him to leave because she needed to use the bathroom. F***ing savage! Trevor admits that he felt disappointed that she wasn't interested in him, but when he closed the bathroom door behind him, a guy with short blonde hair came up to Trevor and demanded to know what he and Roxy had been doing in the bathroom. Thinking that that guy might be Roxy's boyfriend, Trevor insisted that nothing had happened, and the guy started laughing before telling Trevor that he thought Roxy was sexy, reassuring Trevor that the blonde guy was just some idiot. A little over an hour later, Roxy walked up to Trevor again, and this time she seemed wasted. Apparently, she had tried to flirt with a basketball player and he had rejected her, and when she tried to kiss Trevor again, he also pushed her away. She was overly flirty and affectionate, and when the party ended around 2 a.m. on the 25th of May 1996, Roxy was sprawled out on the front lawn of 137 Crandall Way, asleep. Cheryl Anderson had been abandoned by her friends, and another student named Tim Davis offered to walk her to her dorm. When they walked blast to sleeping Kristen, Tim told Kristen that she had to leave. She complained that she was cold, and Tim and Cheryl offered to take her home. Kristen was unable to walk on her own, so Tim placed an arm around her body and helped keep her upright. As they left the yard, a blonde student named Paul Flores came up to them and offered to help carry Kristen, since she lived in the dormitory building next to his, about half a mile or a kilometer away in a group of buildings known as the Red Bricks. The four of them walked along the empty, brightly lit streets until Tim reached the parking lot where his car was parked. Cheryl and Paul reassured him that they could manage, and they continued onwards. According to Cheryl, Kristen was shivering, and Paul had moved his hand so that he was now holding on to Kristen's bare stomach, stopping just short of groping her and making Cheryl uncomfortable. Kristen would stop walking every few steps, and then Paul would jokingly try to convince Cheryl that they should go on without them. They would manage without her. Instead, Cheryl waited until the two of them caught up with her and then kept on walking. When they reached Cheryl's dormitory buildings, she asked Paul if he would ensure that Kristen reached her dorm room. I feel like Cheryl should stick around. Please, Cheryl. <laughs> I said, will you walk her to her room? You know, will you take her back to her room? And he said, yes. And I said something about, yes? And I said, if you won't, I will do it. I'll walk her to her room. You know, I didn't want to have to do it. 
you know, if he didn't want to do it, I was going to do it. Paul promised to walk Kristen to her room, then jokingly asked Cheryl if she'd give him a goodbye kiss. Cheryl refused, and then Paul asked for a hug, still holding the zoned-out Kristen to him. Creeped out? Yes, pretty creepy. Paul is sounding a bit creepy. Cheryl hurried back to her dorm room, and Paul continued to carry Kristen until he reached the entrance to Santa Lucia Hall. He then watched as Kristen walked the last 40 yards, 36 meters, up a steep incline on her own, climbed a short flight of stairs, and entered Moore Hall before he turned and headed to his own room inside Santa Lucia Hall. Also, he claimed, yeah, this seems like, I don't know, this could have gone a, a, a different way, couldn't it? bit of a creepy way. Kristen was supposed to spend the night in Margarita's room since Kristen's roommate was visiting with friends. She never did. Margarita explains that she waited all of Saturday for Kristen to come and see her, but told herself that Kristen was probably hanging out with some of her other friends. When Kristen's roommate, Crystal, returned that afternoon, she found that Kristen's bed was littered with her makeup and other belongings. When Kristen didn't spend the night in her room, Crystal became worried and started asking the other residents of Moore Hall if they'd seen Kristen. When Kristen didn't show up for classes on Monday, Margarita, Crystal, and several other girls gathered in Jennifer Phipps' room and listened in as Jennifer called the campus police to report Kristen was missing. The Cal Poly police told Jennifer that Kristen was probably still on holiday, so Jennifer called the San Luis Obispo Police Department. They told her that she had to report Kristen's disappearance to the campus police department instead. When they called the Cal Poly Police Department again, reporting that no one had seen Kristen since that Friday and they were growing worried, one of their officers agreed to call the Smart family to find out if they knew where their daughter was. Denise answered the phone and told the Cal Poly Police that she hadn't heard from her daughters since Friday. Instead of logging a missing persons report, the Cal Poly officer noted that Kristen was probably out camping with friends. According to Margarita, I remember us telling them she has been gone for over 24 hours. Why are you waiting longer? They just didn't react quick enough. They let time go by. All of the evidence that was probably vital. That is where I think things went wrong. Yeah, I mean, the police must have to deal... The, the thing with missing persons, right, is there must be so many that then turn out to be nothing. So the police in this situation must be like, oh my god, we've heard this like a thousand times before. And like a th- one time out of a thousand, it's something. But 999 is nothing. So, like, I don't know whether to be like, well, this is just clearly negligence and bad policing, or whether it's just like, well, this is how it always happens. I don't know, it's not good either way, I guess, but, like, I don't know. Cal Poly Police finally opened a missing persons report on Tuesday the 28th of May, 1996, and started investigating Kristen's disappearance. Crystal told Cal Poly that all of Kristen's belongings were still in her room. Her clothes, ID, money, cards, and red makeup bag. That's mega suspicious. If someone's not taking their ID and money, it'd be like modern day if someone's phone and bank card are missing. Uh, Or like they've gone, and their phone and bank card are still there. That's incredibly suspicious. I'll be like, what? what, People don't not have that stuff with them. That's the stuff they have. Or like keys or something. The next day, Trevor Walter was visiting friends at the Kappa Chi fraternity house when one of them asked if he'd remembered Roxy from the party that Friday night. They told him that the police had been asking questions and asked that anyone who had any contact with her come forward. They also sent out questionnaires and asked students who thought they might know what had happened to Kristen to complete the forms and hand them in. Cal Poly police eventually managed to track down Cheryl Anderson, Tim Davies, and Paul Flores and interviewed all three of them on the 30th of May 1996, five days after Kristen was last seen. On the surface, they were told a similar story. Tim Davies, a senior, explained that before that night, he'd never met Kristen before. Sharon Anderson, a freshman, explained that she'd often seen Kristen around campus, but that she didn't know her. And Paul Flores, another freshman, explained that he didn't know Kristen and that he didn't find her attractive. All three of them told the police how they'd escorted Kristen home. All three of them explained that Tim had left first and that Cheryl then left Kristen alone with Paul. He admitted to being the last person to see her, but insisted that he had nothing to do with her disappearance. Paul repeatedly told the police that he and Kristen had parted ways at the entrance to Santa Lucia Hall and that, quote, she walked that way and I walked to my dorm. Paul claimed, that after he and Kristen parted ways on Saturday morning, he went back to his dorm and tried to sleep, but he threw up at around four in the morning. He then took a shower and went back to bed, and he was sure that someone saw him walking down the hallway, although he didn't know who. He spent the day watching TV, and on Saturday night, he and a few friends went to a movie, but he couldn't provide the police with the full names or addresses of his friends who acted as his alibis. <laughs> yeah, I have to say, like, this is... <laughs> It doesn't feel not familiar. It reminds me of my student days. It'd be like, yeah, go to a party, get pretty drunk, <laughs> try and go to sleep, too drunk to sleep. Then the next day, just be like, oh, I'm just going to watch shows all day. And maybe go to Greg's and get a sandwich. <laughs> and then it'd be like, evening come around, you feel slightly better. It'd be like, should we go out to the movies? <laughs> be like, yes. Uh, uh, and I lived in halls as well, so it's, it's very familiar. 
On Sunday, his father picked him up, and they spent all day in his father's garage working on his truck before being arrested by the Arroyo Grand Police on Sunday night for not appearing at a hearing for DUI charge. Okay, that's less familiar to me. <laughs> Never been arrested. Never got DUI. <laughs> But Cheryl told the Cal police officers that she had already been familiar with Paul before that night. She'd often seen him on campus and thought that he was kind of creepy. They often, Cheryl, you just left her, you left your mate with the kind of creepy dude. Don't do that. They often attended the same parties together, and when he was drunk, Paul would flirt with anyone in a skirt and make a nuisance of himself. He had a habit of forcing himself on girls and trying to kiss them, or groping them without their permission before laughing it off like it was a joke. Dude, this is Cheryl, you left your mate with creepy Paul. Like, what the f***? I mean, it's not your fault. It's creepy Paul for being creepy. But I don't know. Like, <laughs> don't do that. During one party they'd attended, Paul had tried to kiss one of her friends, and afterward they referred to him as Chester the Molester. Ah! <laughs> Which begs the question, if she already knew what kind of guy he was, why did she leave Kristen with him? Yes, yes. I fucking love that nickname, Chester the Molester. Tim Davies told the police that it seemed Paul... I mean, Chester, hanging around Kristen the night of the party. At one point, he'd heard a crash and saw that Kristen was lying on the floor in the hallway and Paul was sprawled out on top of her trying to kiss her. He didn't know if she'd fallen or if Paul had pushed her, but it agreed with other eyewitness accounts, which explains that Paul had been hovering around Kristen all night. Trevor Bolter was also brought in for questioning, and he had told the police about his introductions with Kristen that night. He told them how a blonde guy had confronted him after he left Kristen in the bathroom and had demanded to know what they'd been up to. When he was shown a photo of Paul, Trevor identified him as Blonde Dude. An Australian exchange student had reported that he'd been heading home on his bicycle when he saw a man and a tall girl argue in front of Sequoia Hall, which is situated next to Santa Lucia and Warhols. Cal Poly detectives interviewed one of Paul's friends, and they told the police that on Saturday night, Paul had a black eye, several scratches on the back of his hands, and rug burns on his knees. And when they asked him if more guys had tackled him at the party for being inappropriate with their girlfriends, Paul said that he couldn't remember how he got it. He simply woke up with it. When the Cal Poly detectives brought Paul in for questioning on the 31st of May, he told them that he got the black eye when playing basketball with his friends on Monday. When he was questioned again on the 19th of June, they informed him that they have people who testified that he already had the black eye on Saturday. He denied it, and he told the detectives that he got the black eye when he changed the stereo on his truck at 2am on Sunday morning, not Sunday afternoon like it originally claimed. <laughs> Dude, what are you doing? You can't just change your story like that. When the detectives called him out on the lie, he explained that it's not really a lie, it's a fib. It's so minute, you could probably call it a white lie. Bro, that, <laughs> you're talking to the police. Also, how are you getting a black eye changing your radio in a car? <laughs> Bang! Oh no! <laughs> Again, he recounted his version of the events of that night and insisted that they had nothing to do with Kristen's disappearance. He started becoming more pronounced as he waffled between his different versions of what had happened that night. Uh-oh. Two detectives outright told him that they didn't believe his story. Yeah, <laughs> and threatened him with a polygraph test. But Paul shrugged it off and explained that they could think whatever they wanted. But he had to go. He'd promised his mother that he would help her clean up some concrete rubble from her backyard that afternoon at 4pm and it was getting late. And despite numerous eyewitness accounts, despite Cheryl's testimony, despite the fact that Paul was the last person to be seen with her, despite his black eye, despite his lack of verifiable alibi, and despite the fact that Kristen was still missing, Cal Poly police initially reported that the 19-year-old Kristen was a girl with loose morals who hadn't been happy at Cal Poly. What the f***? Um, how about, instead of judging her, you do your f***ing job? It's not like, oh yeah, she disappeared because of her loose morals. No, no, no! No, no, no. They concluded that she'd simply ran away and would reappear eventually. The f***? The, the f***ing this creepy pool! Look into creepy pool more! On the 31st of May, their report went as followed. Quoting, Victim attends party and does not return home afterwards. Does not contact friends or family and skips school. During the course of my investigation, I have spoken with many people who have been associated with Smart. They have all told stories that agreed with each other. The stories have all included the following information. Smart does not have any close friends at Cal Poly. Smart appeared to be under the influence of alcohol on Friday night. Smart was talking and socializing with seven different males at the party. Smart lives her life her own way, not conforming to typical teenage behavior. These observations are in no way implying that her behavior caused her disappearance, but they provide a picture of her conduct on the night of her disappearance. Wait, this is the police? Okay, and it says... The observations are in no way implying that her behavior caused her disappearance. But that's kind of exactly what you're saying when you say she ran away and she's got, like, loose morals and shit. So, how about police? Stop doing that and start doing your job. By the end of June, they'd label Kristen as an adult missing under unusual circumstances. 
they elected to hand the case over to the sheriff's office. Convinced that the police weren't serious about finding their daughter, the Smart family did what they could to find Kristen. Denise called everyone she could think of, including the sheriff's office and the FBI, and camped out next to the telephone. Stan drove to San Luis Obispo every weekend and searched dump sites, sewage pipes, hiking trails, and abandoned houses for any sign of his missing daughter. Denise spoke to every reporter, journalist, private investigator, and psychic who was willing to help them look for Kristen. They kept a notebook by the phone in Kristen's room and logged every lead and piece of information that came their way. They even hired a trained dog handler whose job it was to follow up on any and all leads that the smarts received. Years went by without any sign of their daughter. But Stan and Denise told their friends and family, and the Stockton record, that they wouldn't rest until they found Kristen. Quote, You live because you can't give up. Because it's not just a battle to find your daughter. It's a battle to have the right thing done. It's a battle to have people do their job. You're goddamn right. Active and ongoing. On the 26th of June, 1996, Kristen had already been missing for more than a month when the Cal Poly Police Department finally handed Kristen's file over to the San Luis Obispo County Sheriff's Office. At the time, Denise Bart likened their search for a missing daughter to investigation into a missing bike. And unfortunately, she wasn't far off. The detectives went through the case file and noted several important pieces of evidence were missing. Cal Poly Police hadn't sealed off Kristen's room following her disappearance, Paul's room was never searched, and when he left campus for the summer, his room in Santa Lucia Hall was emptied out and thoroughly cleaned by the janitorial staff, effectively removing any trace evidence that might have been left behind. Cal Poly Police also didn't obtain the call records for Paul's room, and by the time the sheriff's office put in a request for copies, they were told that the university had already wiped the records. On the 29th of June, 1996, Cal Poly was closed for the summer. When the sheriff's office, the California Rescue Dog Association, aka CADA, and 400 volunteers from the community descended on the campus and conducted a search for any sign of Kristen or her remains. Teams of horses tackled the hiking trails. People searched the bushes and sewage system. Dogs searched the empty fields. People searched the local rubbish dump. And teams of cadaver dogs were led into the red bricks to look for any sign of Kristen's body. The handlers were only told that they were looking for a missing girl. And they each entered the building separately, giving their dogs a distinctive order like bones or look for bones to let them know that they were looking for a decomposing body. Now seems like a good time to explain how these dogs are trained, since cadaver dogs feature a lot in this case. According to Becky Pasitska, a certified dog trainer and nose work instructor with dogtastic training, the human body starts emitting a distinctive gas within seconds of dying, and that gas can linger in the area for decades with some of the oldest human graves being found being over 60 years old. Oh my god. I was just like, well, they train the dogs to look for bones. But whoa, there's way more to it. That's fascinating. Some dogs can even find a decomposing body under 40 feet of water. Even if a body is removed shortly after death and the area is cleaned with bleach, that distinctive smell will remain up to 20 years later. Oh my god, that's kind of grim. <laughs> like a dog goes into the house and they're like, many people have died here. <laughs> like, oh no, but it's been cleaned. I've remodeled. Cadaver dogs are trained specifically to find human remains, and are trained to find teeth, bones, blood, and the location where human remains had previously been found. One dog handler also explained that they used cotton swabs that had been placed on a body during an autopsy to train their dogs, and cadaver dogs can be led into a field containing several decomposing animals, and they still only alert their handlers to the presence of human remains. On the day of the search, wow, cadaver dogs are amazing! I had no idea, I was like, do we really need to explain cadaver dogs? And now I'm like, yes! Fun facts. I mean, <laughs> dark facts. Four cadaver dogs were led down the hallways of Moore Hall and cleared it. They repeated this process in Sequoia Hall and once again in Santa Lucia Hall. Wayne Barons entered the building first, and he led Sierra, a Labrador retriever, down each hallway. On the ground floor, Sierra made a U-turn when they passed room 128 and then sat down to let Wayne know that she'd scented a decomposing body. Oh my god, is that going to be what's-his-face's room? Is that going to be uh, Chester the Molester's room? and then sat down to let Wayne know there was a decomposed body. They continued searching the rest of the building and then left. And half an hour later, Adele Morris and her border collie, Chola, were led inside. They also started on the ground floor, and shortly after passing room 128, Chola alerted Adele that he scented a decomposing body. Adele led another border collie named Cirque inside, and he also alerted her to room 128. Jesus Christ, there's a body. <laughs> we know. There's a fourth dog. Detectives were called to the deceit. See, there's a fourth dog goes in and the detectives come. The door was opened, and one by one the dogs were led inside. The room was bare, and two empty beds stood on opposite sides of the room. Each dog headed straight for the bed on the left side of the room, each coming to a stop at the foot of the bed and alerting their handler that once upon a time someone had died on the foot of that bed. Oh my god. 
I, d- I don't want ever to have a cadaver dog in my house or my office because they'd be like, yeah, someone died here. I'd be like, oh, oh no. And it's like, yeah, like natural death. They were really old, but it's still like, oh, now I, all I associate with that part of the house is death. Can you imagine like the people, who, the students who now in like room 128 at, or was it Sequoia Hall, Santa Lucia Hall, something like that? Like you're in the death room. <laughs> God. I remember one of, the, one of the craziest coincidences of my whole life. I went to university and I was assigned like a room in, in halls, like here. And then I go home for the summer or like for Easter or whatever. And I'm hanging out with one of my old mates from school who has a, a new boyfriend and we're just chatting it up. And he's like, oh yeah, I went to, I went to this university. And I'm like, oh yeah, which hall? He's like, I stayed in this hall. And I'm like, really? Which block? And he's like, this block. And I'm like, Jesus Christ, that's where, my, that's where I stay right now. And he's like, I'm like, which room? And he's like, this room. And I'm like, no shot. <laughs> and we, it turned out we stayed in the same fucking room. <laughs> it's like, what are the odds? It's not a small university. Detectives from the sheriff's office checked their records and confirmed that two students, Derek Say and Paul Flores, Chester the Molester, used to live in room 128 in Santa Lucia Hall. They questioned Derek on the 12th of July, 1996, and he told detectives that he hadn't been on campus during Memorial Day weekend. Paul had the room to himself. Derek also explained that Paul had told him that he'd escorted Kristen to the main entrance of Muir Hall. When Derek had jokingly asked Paul what he'd done to Kristen, Paul joked and said, She's at my house, eating lunch with my mum. In a ha-ha, I totally tapped that kind of way, and prompting the sheriff's department to file a warrant to search the Flores family home. <laughs> Dude, it's f***ing creepy. On the 22nd of July, 1996, the detectives from the sheriff's department arrived at Ruben Flores' White Court House in Arroyo Grande, which is the 30-minute drive south of San Luis Obispo. According to a spokesperson, their aim was to look for anything that could link Paul to Kristen, so they focused on the house itself. They didn't bring cadaver dogs, they didn't bring a forensics team, and they didn't touch any of the vehicles on the property, which included Ruben's white Nissan and Paul's green Ford Ranger. During their search, they found an old police baton that belonged to Ruben Flores and confiscated it. They also found three newspaper articles on Kristen Smart's disappearance in the house. Um, bruh. That's some serial killer shit right there. One in the kitchen, one underneath Paul Flores' bed, and another underneath Ruben Flores' mattress. None of the items were considered enough to be proof that Paul had anything to do with Kristen's disappearance, and the detectives were left with no viable leads to follow. It is extremely suspicious and weird, though, isn't it? Paul was brought before a grand jury in October 1996, but they ruled that there wasn't enough evidence to convict Paul of anything. Okay, well, I, sorry, I thought, so the detectives didn't have any leads, but they still were like, yeah, grand jury, get on this. The grand jury is the one that decides whether it goes to, like, a trial. And, okay, so fair enough, but that, you know, that's what the grand jury's for. In late October 1996, a woman named Mary Lassiter called the San Luis Obispo Sheriff's Office and told the officer on duty that she had a possible lead in the Kristen Smart case. She and her family had moved into a house on Branch Street in Arroyo Grande on the 1st of October 1996. The house is owned by Susan Flores, and after moving in, they started receiving a number of threatening postcards in the mail. All of the postcards urged the reader to convince their son to come clean to the police and help the Smarts to find Kristen's body. Oh my god, who knows who did it? Who knows that Chester the molester did it? The Lassiters were now in town, but they soon found out that Paul Flores was a suspect in the disappearance of a 19-year-old girl named Kristen Smart, and their spidey senses started tingling. Yeah, <laughs> your spidey senses shouldn't be tingling. They should be like... <laughs> You see, Ruben Flores had kept a closed trash can in the driveway that first week and had asked them not to touch it before he eventually carted it away. Dude, it's always like, don't touch my trash can. I'll be like, I'm going to look in that Because <laughs> he'd be like, why'd you tell me that? I wasn't going to. A week later, Mary was washing her car when she found a woman's earring in the driveway close to where the trash can had stood. It was cheap, silver-plated jewellery, and the earring was in the shape of a teardrop. It had a small turquoise stone in the middle, and what looked like a dried, bloody fingerprint on the back. Later, Mary would explain that the earring seemed to match a necklace that Kristen wore in a senior photo that had been printed on the missing posters. Thinking that it had to have something to do with Kristen's disappearance, they bagged it and called the police. Oh my god, police, please do something. It is your time. A burly detective came to see them and asked questions about the earring. They handed the earring over, and Mary explained that, apart from the earring and the threatening postcards, there was something else that the detective should know. Every morning at 4.20 a.m., Mary heard the incessant beeping of a watch alarm. Oh, my God. Oh, my God, that was the time she woke up to go to the swimming thing, right? So her watch is somewhere in there in the house. Ah! She had managed to trace it to a newly built planter box in the backyard. Ah! No! Oh, God! 
Oh God, the watch is buried on her body under in the in the garden. Oh, that's f***ed up. Ah, no, I was holding. I know it's ridiculous that I'm holding on hope that this person's still alive, but I like this person. Ah, oh no. But since the entire yard was covered in concrete, she hadn't been able to locate the watch itself. They'd dug up the flower box, but only managed to dig six inches before they hit another layer of concrete. They showed the detective the planter box, but he only nodded, took the earring, and left. They never heard back from him. What the f***, police? Do your job! Meanwhile, Paul Flores had dropped out of college and signed up to join the Navy. The smarts had their attorney, John Murphy, file a wrongful death suit against Paul in an attempt to keep him in the country, and his application to join the Navy was denied. Excellent. As part of the civil suit, John Murphy's law office was allowed to subpoena witnesses and launch their own investigation into the disappearance of Kristen Smart. At the end of January 1997, they spoke to Cheryl, some old co-workers of Paul's, Mary Lassiter and her husband. Mary Lassiter told John Murphy and the Smarts about the earring they'd found, but when the Smarts asked the sheriff's office if they could be allowed to see the earring to determine if it did belong to Kristen, the sheriff's office explained that the earring was a dead end since it looked like something a child would wear. Oh my god, if I was this person's family, I'd be so pissed. I'd just be like, even I'm reading this, and I'm like, do your f***ing job. Can you imagine being a parent? Christ, get your shit together, police. Furthermore, it had never been logged into evidence, and it had been misplaced. Are you f***ing joking? It's a murder investigation. In March of 1997, Susan Flores somehow found out that the Lassiters had been talking to the police and the Smarts and told Mary that she and her family had 30 days to vacate her property. In a woefully spiteful move, Mary Lassiter confirmed that as long as she lived in the house, California rental state laws say that she could invite whoever she wanted into her house, so she called the Smarts and basically told them, Do you want to dig up the backyard? F***ing <laughs> legend. Let's in go. On the 3rd of March 1997, John Murphy arranged for Carter cadaver dogs and a geologist armed with ground penetrating radar or GPR to search the Brant Street house property. Once again, we've reached a valuable teaching moment, since ground penetrating radar is also going to come up a lot in this episode. According to Dr. Larry Lawrence, the guy who literally wrote the book on ground penetrating radar, the ground is hard, and the longer it's left alone, the harder it is. Once you dig up a section of the ground, you loosen the dirt, and if it's then left alone, it will harden again, but it won't be as hard as the surrounding area. GPR sends waves into the earth and measures how hard the ground is. Changes in the hardness of the area pop up on the GPR, and things like rocks or pieces of concrete will pop up as an anomaly. Bones and human remains can't be found using GPR since bone is porous, but GPR can be used to identify a recent burial site. During the search of the Branch Street house, the dogs cleared the house, the attic, and the crawl space underneath the house, but when they entered the backyard, they alerted to the area where Ruben Flores had kept the trash can. The geologist then scanned the yard, but he also came up empty and explained to John Murphy in the smarts that his equipment was thrown off by the concrete that filled the backyard. But he did note that a portion of the yard had been dug up recently and that a pile of dirt had been piled against one of the walls. The neighbors also confirmed that shortly after Kristen's disappearance, Reuben and Paul Flores had done some construction work in the yard, and the last just confirmed that the suspicious planter box measured six feet by three feet. <laughs> Dude, and that nothing would grow in it. <sighs> In essence, they still had nothing but suspicions, and John Murphy submitted their reports to the sheriff's office. On the 23rd of May 1997, almost a year after Kristen had gone missing, Sheriff Ed Williams told the San Luis Obispo Telegram T Tribune that, quote, We need Paul Flores to tell us what happened to Kristen Smart. The fact of the matter is, we are very qualified detectives who have conducted over a hundred interviews, and everything leads to Mr. Flores. There are no other suspects. So absent something from Mr. Flores, I don't see us completing this case. How about you go dig up the backyard? Just go do it. What the f***? And Paul Flores took the sheriff's advice. On the 19th of November 1997, Paul, Reuben, and Susan Flores finally showed up for depositions that had been arranged by John Murphy. Reuben and Susan answered all the questions posed to them, but whenever Paul was asked a question, he responded with, On the advice of my attorney, I refuse to answer that question based on the Fifth Amendment of the United States Constitution. So it's like the right to, not the right to silence. Is it right to silence? The right to like against self-incrimination or whatever? Where you're just like, I plead the fifth. There you go, pleading the fifth. Staying, shutting your face. Just over a year would pass before the DA's office made another concerted effort to investigate Kristen's disappearance and called the FBI for assistance. Fucking finally! FBI, be the heroes in this story. You're very good at shit. Go in there and show this sheriff's office how shit is done. 
January 1999, the FBI re-interviewed Paul, his father Reuben, and a number of witnesses, and together with the sheriff's office, they started working through Kristen's case file again. During their investigation, oh wait, we know who the hero to this story is. It's a podcast. It's not the FBI. Come on, FBI, don't let me down, though. This is your time to shine, FBI. During the investigation, they came across the report submitted by John Murphy, and at 8am on the 19th of June 2000, they handed Susan Flores a search warrant that read, Reasonable cause exists to believe that Kristen Smart's body is buried in the backyard of Susan Flores' home on Branch Street. Yes! They basically had permission to do whatever they wanted that day, and they brought their own GPR devices to scan the yard. The garage had been built where the trash cans once stood, and it was packed full of boxes and other rubbish. When the GPR expert tried to scan the area, he noted that the floor had been reinforced with iron rods, and that they played havoc with his equipment. They didn't find any signs of a grave in the backyard, and that evening, the detectives decided they weren't going to dig up the backyard. Just dig it f***ing up! Just how much effort is this? Just go and knock down that bloody shed, give them a couple of grand to rebuild the shed, assuming that you don't find a body, assuming that everything's fine, but just dig that shit up for God's sake. Later it'd be suggested that they didn't want to be liable for fixing the yard up again. Just pay for it! It's, not, it's just the taxpayer's money! How much is it? It's not much! You're the government! You have infinite money! Find the body! When they left the Branch Street house at 5pm that afternoon, the search warrant expired and the sheriff's office would never be able to search the property again. Why not? You can't issue a search warrant again? It's like some double indemnity sh**. Uh, double indemnity? Double immunity? What's it called? Ah, oh, what's that called? Double jeopardy. Thank you. On the 25th of May 2002, Kristen was legally declared dead and the smarts started raising funds to erect two billboards to raise awareness regarding her disappearance. What's this of f***ing Chester molesters all out and about, even though it's like super, super, super suspicious? One was placed in front of John Murphy's law office, and the other was just down the road from Susan Forrest's house on Branch Street. When the billboards were erected in April 2004, Denise Smart told reporters that, We want to keep Kristen's memory alive. Billboards are the only way we can remind people that she's still missing after eight years. It's the only gift we can give to her to make sure she's not forgotten. In 2011, Ian Parkinson was elected as the new sheriff of San Luis Obispo County Sheriff's Office, and from the get-go, he applied for permission to appoint detectives who'd be solely responsible for investigating cold cases, including Kristen's. Excellent, Ian. I like you already. Let's go. Detective Clint Cole was appointed as the lead investigator on the Kristen Smart case in or around 2016, and he tackled the daunting task of going through thousands of reports and familiarizing himself with Kristen Smart's case. It later explained that since Sheriff Parkinson took over in 2011, at least 80 new search warrants have been issued, 8 new locations have been searched, 140 new pieces of evidence were found, and 91 new witnesses were interviewed. And yet, they still weren't any closer to finding out what had happened to Kristen Smart. The Podcast In one of my previous episodes, Simon mentioned that he loves the cases where a dedicated police detective solves the case. Well, as the title of both the episode and this section suggests, the hero's title is a little bit more unorthodox. On the 9th of May 2018, singer-songwriter named Chris Lambert published his latest album, The Constant Education of Christopher Lambert, and at a talk hosted by the Slow Chamber of Commerce in February 2020, he joked that, quote, I woke up the next morning, like many creative people do, feeling empty and useless and like I might never create anything good again. Chris explains that he logged into his computer when he fell down a Wikipedia rabbit hole and spent the day just exploring whatever popped into his mind. He'd grown up in Orchid, California, just 30 miles south of Arroyo Grande, and he was eight years old when Kristen Smart disappeared. He'd driven past the Kristen Smart billboard for 14 years at that point, and that day he was curious to find out if they'd ever found her. To quote him, What I didn't know was that there'd been a person of interest since day one of the investigation. I didn't know why he was still out. I didn't know what happened. But by later that night, I was completely obsessed with the case, and I was shocked that everybody wasn't talking about it constantly, and I was shocked that no one had done a documentary about it. There was just a brief, momentary flash that day where I thought, maybe I'm going to make a documentary. And then I pushed that away like a lot of people do. I'm a musician. I don't do things like that. Not to mention, I'm quiet, I'm awkward, and I'm not a professional anything at all. Chris became obsessed with the idea of finding justice for Kristen, and he spent the next year and a half learning everything he could about Kristen's case. A friend told him that she'd gone to high school with Paul and offered to introduce him to people who provided him with insight into who Paul Flores was. He gave him access to the kind of resources that he needed to really sink his teeth into Kristen's story, and for the first time, Chris believed that he was in a position to help bring about justice for Kristen Smart. Legends. This is very exciting. <laughs> 
This is, it's also because like when the FBI come in, I'm like, yes, FBI, go, go, go. But this is it's just a regular dude, which makes it so much more relatable. <laughs> it's like, yes. And he's going to, I don't know what he's going to do, but I get the feeling it's going to be good. To quote him again, it's a little different if you have access to some of the people and places involved. It's different when someone goes missing in your own backyard. He read thousands of articles on Kristen's disappearance, obtained copies of her case file that had been released to the public, got into contact with the Smart family and John Murphy and interviewed them. He read through the testimonies of the witnesses, watched the testimonies of Paul and Reuben, and started tracking down Kristen's friends, people who'd been at the party that night, and people who'd once worked with Paul Flores. He walked the route that Kristen, Cheryl, Tim, and Paul had taken that night. He spoke with the students who lived in room 128 in Santa Lucia Hall, and he watched on with the chilling realization as they showed him how they stored their surfboards in their room by easily lifting them through the dorm window. Wait, what's that got to do with anything? Oh God, is that how he like gets the body out of the- Oh God. He also learned more about the Flores family. He learned that Reuben Flores used to be in the Navy, and that after he was honorably discharged in 1963, he worked as a police reservist for the Redondo Police for a few years. At the time of Kristen's disappearance, Reuben worked for a phone technician, or a GTE, and would drive all over Arroyo Grande fixing payphones and collecting money. The 30-year-old Reuben married his second wife Susan when she was 20, and the couple had a daughter named Irma Linda together in March 1974. On the 22nd of October 1976, Paul was born, and they moved to Arroyo Grande in June 1992. According to Susan's old co-workers, their marriage wasn't a happy one, and Susan would often show up at work with new bruises or broken ribs. Oh my lord, they didn't have a happy marriage. He was enormously abusive. That's Christ. When they asked about it, she'd shrug and claim that she fell or walked into a door or stumbled over a porch bench. She allegedly started an affair with one of her co-workers, Mike McConville, and Susan later filed for divorce. Excellent move, Susan. She and Reuben were officially divorced in April 1996, but on the night when Kristen disappeared, Susan was spending the night at Reuben's house and would move back in for a few months after leasing out her Branch Street house to the Lassiters. Chris also found out that Paul Flores' life had essentially been ruined after Kristen Smart disappeared. After being rejected by the Navy, he had worked a series of low-paying jobs in the fast food industry or worked as an attendant at full-service gas stations where he washed people's car windows and filled their gas tanks. Once his employers or co-workers found out that he was a suspect in the disappearance of Kristen Smart, he'd be let go and had to move to a new town to start over. Yeah, I have to say, like, this feels... Like, in my mind, Paul is fucking guilty as sin. If it turns out he's not, I'll be pretty surprised. But also, he's not been proven guilty of anything. They didn't have enough evidence. So should his life be ruined? Should he be fired all the time because of this? Because there are going to be plenty of people in Paul's position who didn't actually do the crime. It's pretty intense. He eventually settled down in San Pedro, lived in a house that his parents had bought for him, and still relied on them to support him financially. Many of his neighbors thought that he was just a quiet guy, but noted that strange people would take pictures of his house, leave threatening messages for him, and that journalists often came by asking questions about him. Chris also learned that after Sheriff Ed Williams outed Paul Flores as a suspect in the disappearance of Kristen Smart, both Susan and Reuben were hounded by the media as supporters of the Smart family for over two decades. That's not fair, they're just the parents. And I know Reuben seems like a bit of an abusive piece of shit, in my opinion, allegedly, but still, not really cool, guys. They protested in the streets outside their homes, took photos of them, held candlelit vigils in Kristen's honor on their front lawn, and of course erected a billboard with Kristen's face next to Susan's house. Even though both Ermelinda and Paul had done their best to escape their community's scrutiny, Susan and Reuben both chose to stay behind in Arroyo Grande. According to Chris, quote, Their lives have been anything but peaceful there. With a population of just over 15,000, most people in town know who they are, where they live, and what they've been accused of. Were they... Uh, how were they involved there was something about the trash can right like were they involved in helping like cover up the crime and they she's apparently buried in the backyard so yeah definitely weird the quote continues if you're in your 70s your nearest family member is 200 miles away and the residents of your neighborhood are constantly eyeing you with suspicion why would you not move somewhere else anywhere else I can only come up with two reasonable explanations. The first is that they love Arroyo Grande, I mean, really love it, that, or they're afraid to leave because they're protecting something. On the 30th of September 2019, Chris released the first episode of his new podcast titled Your Own Backyard. The first episode, A Face on a Billboard, was published on the 7th of October, and it was followed by The Only Suspect. Every week, a new episode was released, Their Own Backyard, Son of Susan, 
the P. And the sixth and last episode was posted on the 11th of November, titled Ongoing and Active. And in these episodes, Chris sheds light on a side of Paul's personality that few people have been aware of. He was always staring. Paul Flores started attending St. James Catholic School in Torrance, California in 1982. He played soccer for West Torrance's American Youth Soccer Organization, and according to his old teammates, he had an anger problem and made a habit of stabbing the soccer balls with sharp objects and starting fights with the other children. <laughs> what a psycho. Fucking hell. Susan ran a daycare from our home at the time, and according to one of the mothers, the other parents had called her one afternoon in a panic, telling her that the 11-year-old Paul had tried to drown her daughter in the swimming pool. Christ. Quoting, he really was fixated on my daughter. And on some of the pictures of the birthday parties, it's like he's always right there, like almost hovering over her. And I don't think she even noticed it because she didn't pay attention to him. She was just always avoiding him. All the kids were in the pool, and Paul was in the pool, and he was trying to get her attention, and she just kept going to the other side of the pool to stay away from him, and apparently that upset him. He pushed her under the water, and then was on top of her, and wouldn't let her up. And then all the kids started yelling at him to let her up, let her up, and he wouldn't. He was very angry. My daughter remembered that somebody came out and dragged him out of the pool, and goes, I don't remember if it was Susan, or if it was another adult that was there. The quote ends. The mother collected her daughter. And when she confronted Susan, she simply shrugged it off and explained that Paul was just playing with her daughter and that they were making a big deal out of nothing. By the time Paul started middle school, the other kids started describing him as being creepy and weird. According to a woman who played Little League with him, quote, There was a team directory that went around that had everybody's phone numbers and everything in it. And for a long period of time, I was getting prank calls on a nightly basis, and whoever it was was, was asking for me and breathing. It was scary. Little by little, word got out that it was Paul who was calling, and it was not just me who was calling. My brother had to have a conversation with him and let him know to knock it off. As he got older, Paul turned into a bully and would often pick fights with other kids for no reasons. In 1992, a 16-year-old Paul was involved in a fight with a 13-year-old boy named Nick Spritzer at his school. According to Nick, Paul used to bully him constantly, and that day, Nick decided to stand up for himself. I started to fight back. And I think it turned into a shoving match. At some point, that turned into a wrestling match, and we were on the ground. And he was stronger than me. So he fairly quickly dominated me. Yeah, you're 13. He's 16. That's a huge difference at that age. Nick managed to kick Paul in the face, and Paul rolled away. Nick rolled over to get up, and, quote, While I was still on my shoulder, he jumped up and stomped on my head. By the time Paul was pulled away, Nick was rapidly losing his vision. His father rushed him to their pediatrician and, quote, Our pediatrician apparently told my parents that she watched me deteriorate in front of her eyes. They then rushed him to the hospital, and by that time, Nick didn't know who he was. He couldn't speak, and he had no control over his body and blacked out. I was in and out of consciousness for several days. I was in the hospital for a total of five days. It was 72 hours before I could answer basic questions about what year it was or what day it was. What the fuck? This guy's like giving him like a proper full-on concussion coma sort of shit. Like brain damage. This guy's got to go away to like military school or like a borstal or whatever they call it these days where the naughty kids go. Nick's family sued the Flores family and the judge ordered that the Flores family had to pay Nick's family $5,000 to cover their medical expenses. Paul was also ordered to attend anger management classes. He never did, and for years, Reuben and Susan made excuses for their son's behavior, telling John Murphy in 1997 that Nick and two others had been the ones to bully Paul and insisting that he had been the real victim. <laughs> Please. He stomped on a kid's head. Either way, the Flores family moved to Arroyo Grande and purchased the house on White Court in June 1992. Paul was enrolled in Arroyo Grande High School, and Susan brought him a brand new, iridescent green Ford Raptor pickup truck in 1993. The truck was his pride and joy, and he used it to rack up several traffic violations for speeding, tailgating, reckless driving, and disturbing the peace. The teenage Paul wasn't unattractive. He had fair skin, blonde hair, blue eyes, and started to build muscle once he joined the football team. He was loud and boisterous, and his stutter only made an appearance when he was nervous or unsure of himself. But he struggled to make friends and the other teenagers would refer to him as Creepy Paul, or Scary Paul, or Psycho Paul. <laughs> Later on, Chester the Molester. If these are your nicknames, you know, adjust your behavior. If people call me Psycho Simon, I'd be like, Jesus Christ, why do people call me that? <laughs> I should adjust myself to appear less like a psycho. Or maybe psychos just don't care. Chris spoke to some of the women who went to school with Paul, and they explained that he would stalk the girls, leave flowers on their doorsteps, or phone their homes and breathe heavily before putting the receiver down. All of them told Chris a variation of the phrase, 
He was always staring, or he always stood there watching. Paul was never invited to parties, and yet he always showed up ready to have fun. He'd get drunk and then aggressively flirt with the girls at the party. When they rebuffed him or ignored him, he'd get angry and attack them, and he often ended up in a fight with more than one pissed-off boyfriend. One girl recounted how after she told him she wasn't interested in him, Paul called her a cock block. <laughs> I haven't heard that phrase in a long time. Before he picked her up and body slammed her on the floor. What the fuck is going on? What the fuck? <laughs> she had the wind knocked out of her. Another girl rushed over to help her. And then a group of guys tackled Paul, knocked him around a bit, and made sure to let him know that it wasn't okay to treat a girl like that. Yes. Fucking yes. <laughs> I'm definitely joining in that shit. It's like, oh, we as a group going to beat this guy up. Fuck yeah, we are. Let's go. <laughs> He knocked another girl from a deck into a garden, resulting in being forcefully escorted from the party. Dude, after you got beaten the shit out of at a party for knocking a girl down, it's time to leave. And if you don't leave, I'd like to think that that group of boys who beat you up come around and beat you the fuck up again. And another girl recounted how they'd found him fleeing one of their classmates after she'd passed out in one of the bedrooms. In 1995, Paul barely made it into Cal Poly and signed up for a food science degree. He failed all of his classes except a bowling elective, but excelled at trolling campus parties. Another woman, let's call her Lisa, later contacted Chris and told him that she was convinced that Paul Flores had drugged her friend. Quoting, Sometime in March or April 1996, I was going to Hancock College and my boyfriend at the time played football at Cal Poly, and so I frequented parties in San Luis with him and his teammates. At one of these parties, Lisa made friends with a Cal Poly student that she'd often seen at these parties. Let's call her Katie. Lisa and Katie hang out at the party, and at one point, Lisa lost track of her. An hour or so later, she heard a blonde guy yell from a bathroom, Somebody get in here and help this girl. Lisa walked over and saw that Katie was lying on the bathroom floor. She was pale and foaming at the mouth. She wasn't wearing any pants. Her underwear was shoved down her legs. She had soiled herself and was vomiting on the floor of the bathroom. Lisa shoved the blonde guy out of the bathroom and started to help Katie clean herself up. While she was giving Katie a cold bath to wake her up, the blonde guy walked back into the bathroom. Lisa yelled at him to get out, and he claimed that he'd come to take out the trash. He had a marked stutter as he explained that he was a friend of Katie's, and he only wanted to help. Lisa yelled at him to get out, so he took the trash can and left. Lisa wrapped Katie in a towel and had one of her friends escort her home, and when she asked the other partygoers if anyone recognized the blonde guy, they all told her they had no idea who he was. He'd just shown up uninvited. It was not until I saw him on one of the news programs stuttering and I saw his face. Then that's when I knew that that was the person who was in the bathroom with her initially and also the person that came back into the bathroom to take the trash out. Going to college and all those parties, I'm thinking, no guy cares about taking the trash out in the bathroom at a party. The quote ends. Lisa Chris and some of Paul's old co-workers all suspect that Paul had used eye drops to drug the women at Cal Poly and later in life. Eye drops. <laughs> Really? <laughs> According to the American Academy of Ophthalmology, eye drops typically contain a chemical known as tetrahydrazoline, or THZ. Really? And when ingested, it can result in drowsiness, slow breathing, a slow heartbeat, and even a coma. Oh my god, I had no idea that eye drops could do this. What? According to a case study published in Science Direct in September 2012, if you mix a few drops of THZ with alcohol and drink it, it can cause you to appear heavily intoxicated. Science Direct, don't publish that. <laughs> I feel like if you just if you discover this, <laughs> just be like, let's not talk about it. Let's just not mention that. Because people are definitely going to abuse that. According to Mount Sinai Healthcare System's website, too much of it can result in profuse vomiting, diarrhea, muscle weakness, low body temperature, seizures, a coma, and even death. Worse still, Chris interviewed a number of Dane Does who contacted him and told him that between 1998 and 2018, Paul Flores had drugged them, taken them to his house, and then sexually assaulted them. One woman who went into his house willingly had been drugged after she asked him for a glass of water. She then woke up to Paul shoving a red ball gag in her mouth and repeatedly assaulting her as she passed in and out of consciousness. She also claims that when she left his house the next morning, she angrily told him, when a girl says no, she means no. And when Chris asked them if they thought Paul Flores was capable of murder, they all said, without a doubt. Good f***ing lord. Episode 7. The Tip of the Iceberg Chris Lambert had originally planned that his podcast, Your Own Backyard, would only be six episodes long. But by the time the third episode aired, he'd been flooded with emails containing various tips and leads into not only Kristen Smart's disappearance, but also Paul Flores' background, leading to him releasing four more episodes over the course of the next two years. 
During the year and a half that he researched Kristen's story, he'd made friends with various residents in both Arroyo Grande and San Pedro, where Paul now lived, and they sent him constant updates regarding the movements of Reuben, Susan, and Paul Flores. Chris had reached out to the San Luis Obispo County Sheriff's Office in October 2019 and asked them if he could interview them for the podcast. In a postscript, he added that someone close to Susan Flores had told him that not only were they convinced that Reuben and Susan had helped Paul to get rid of Kristen's body, but that Susan was obsessed with his podcast. Apparently, she liked to lurk on the various Facebook groups that had been created in support of Smart's family in order to keep an eye on what people were saying about her precious little boy. Chris told the sheriff's office that if they wanted to use the podcast to entice Susan or the Flores family into the open, he was more than happy to assist. Chris received an email from Sheriff Parkinson to let him know that they'd consider his request, and then he didn't hear anything back. Unmoist him, they had called a planning meeting with the DA's office the next day and discussed possible strategies that they could use to get the Flores family talking about the case again, and it included listening to the podcast themselves. A number of tips had been called in soon after Chris published the first few episodes of Your Own Backyard, and some of them included references to the two trucks that the Flores family had owned when Kristen Smart had disappeared. Paul's green Ford Ranger and Reuben Flores' white Nissan. Chris had found out that shortly after Kristen's disappearance, Reuben had told a friend of his that he'd bought Paul a new truck bed liner for his birthday. Chris theorized that if they'd transported Kristen's body on the back of Paul's truck, it was possible that her blood or DNA would have been left behind on the bed liner, prompting Reuben to get rid of it. And since Paul's birthday is in October, Reuben's story that he bought Paul a birthday present in June is pretty suspicious. Back in 1997, John Murphy had also thought that this was suspicious, but when he asked Reuben in November 1997 where the trucks were, he explained that they'd sold Paul's Ford and that his Nissan had been stolen. Reuben also claims that the stereo that Paul had removed from his truck on the Sunday night after Chris Dinner had disappeared had also been stolen, and Chris basically called bullshit. The trucks had never been searched, and with the help of the FBI, the Sheriff's Department managed to track them down and search them for any trace evidence. Unfortunately, they didn't find anything. In December 2019, the Sheriff's Office obtained permission to place a wiretap on the phones of the four former members of Flores' family, Reuben, Susan, Paul, and Ermelinda. The warrant only allowed them to monitor the family for 30 days, so in January 2020, Detective Cole reached out to Ermelinda's ex-husband, Brett, and asked him if he would be willing to talk to the police. Brett had called Ermelinda, who called Susan, who then called Paul. Then Detective Cole went to see Ermelinda and handed her a letter as part of an immunity offer. In the letter, Detective Cole explained that, when I started reviewing this case, I kept an open mind and assumed that Paul Flores was not involved in Kristen's disappearance. I now know for sure he is, and Kristen is dead, and so do you. Paul is very soon going to be in a position where he needs to tell us his story. This case will be solved soon. You could be the one who is responsible for ending this nightmare for everyone and move on with your life. Ermelinda slammed the door in Detective Cole's face, but a photo of the letter and the immunity offer made its way to Susan, Reuben, and Paul. Detective Cole later told Chris Lambert that this is one of the problems with wiretapping. Communication methods like email and WhatsApp exist, so the sheriff's office had no idea what they were discussing online. But when they did talk on the phone, the detectives noted that they spoke in code. Well, not very sophisticated code, but they would use references like KS, MW, and You Know Who. But in the end, the sheriff's office had achieved their goal. The Flores family were talking to each other about the case, and a certain podcast was convincing both Reuben and Susan that time was running out. TikTok. On the 26th of January 2020, Susan called her son. Initially, their conversation was about everyday things, how Susan's boyfriend, Mike, was doing family news, a funny post about Paul that Susan had read on one of the Facebook groups, and an upcoming surgery that Susan had to undergo. Then Susan turned to more pressing issues. The Flores family had been in contact with their lawyers, and Susan needed Paul to call his lawyer and get his story straight. She also asked him to send the details of his policies and banking information so that, if he did end up getting arrested, she could ensure that his affairs were in order. Then she told him that she and Reuben managed to put aside some money to pay for his legal defense if necessary, before explaining that she'd rather use that money for herself instead of wasting it on an effort to keep Paul out of prison. <laughs> Irritated, Paul asked her if there was something else she needed, and Susan said yes. Quote, the other thing I need you to do is to start listening to the podcast. I need you to listen to everything they say so we can punch holes in it. Wherever we can punch holes. Maybe we can't. You're the one that can tell me. Oh, holy shit. So guilty. So fucking guilty. Boom. According to Detective Cole, quote, That gives Paul knowledge of what took place. Why else would they want to punch holes in it unless Paul actually knew what happened to Kristen? Sheriff Parkinson, Detective Cole, and the DA had finally what they needed. 
On the 5th of February 2020, people all over the East Coast suddenly woke up with the news that Ruben's house, Susan's house, Paul's house, and Irma Linda's house had all been raided. The police seized all of their electronic devices, their cell phones, laptops, and computers, citing that it was possible they contained evidence that hadn't existed back in 1996. And they were right. And chillingly so. Wait, it's like, that's like 24 years later. What's going to be on this stuff? It all must be much newer than that. Because despite the fact that most of their devices contained ordinary everyday things, Paul's Dell computer contained a folder titled Practice that supported the testimonies of the women that Chris had talked to. In it, the police found hundreds of photos and videos of drugged women with red ball gags in their mouth being assaulted by Paul. Not only that, but also hundreds of explicit videos and photos of kids. And it left no doubt in the police's mind that Paul was a sexual predator. The Meerkats Over the course of the next year, the San Luis Obispo County Sheriff's Office, the DA's office, and Chris Lambert started piecing together what they could to build a prosecutable case against Paul Flores. Chris spent months going through the Smart Family's notebook, and as he explained it, it enabled him to piece together a puzzle of what had happened that Memorial Day weekend. According to Chris, most of the people who'd worked on the case over the years rarely spoke to one another, but because he'd spoken to everybody, he was the only one with all the pieces of the puzzle, and he gave the Sheriff's Office dozens of new leads to follow. Detective Cole had requested that assistant DA Chris Perverell should be assigned to the case, and he immediately agreed. His wife was an avid listener of Your Own Backyard. It's amazing the, the, the reach and power of podcasts. And he started listening to the podcast as well, using it to test his knowledge of the case. Peruville also reached out to Chris to get contact information for some of the women he'd spoken to, helping them to build a stronger case against Paul. On the 25th of November, 2020, Chris released Episode 8, the 16-hour gap, in which he explained that between 2 a.m. and 6 p.m. on Saturday the 25th of May 1996, nobody knows where Paul was. Chris's theory was that after Cheryl had left him with Kristen that night, Paul had tried to get Kristen to follow him to his room. She tried to fight him off because the Australian exchange student had passed them on his bicycle and saw her struggling against Paul. We know from Tim and Cheryl's testimony that Kristen could barely walk, and Paul managed to drag her to his dorm room, which was on the ground floor of Santa Lucia Hall. Chris speculates that Paul had tried to sexually assault Kristen, but ended up killing her instead. It has been suggested that he had stuffed her mouth to keep her from screaming, but that the drugs had caused her to start vomiting during the attack and she suffocated. Panicked, Paul left her there and ran to his sister at Melinda's house, covered in Kristen's vomit. She called Reuben, and Reuben raced to Cal Poly to help Paul. We know this because Susan complained to a colleague of hers that Reuben had ran out of the house that morning and wouldn't tell her where he was going. Early that morning, a woman saw two people running towards a suspicious red car that was parked outside the entrance to Cuesta Park in San Luis Obispo. Her description matches the convertible red Chevrolet that Irma Linda had been driving at the time, and it's been theorized that they'd dumped some evidence in the park. Search parties would later search the park, but they found nothing. Meanwhile, Paul helped Reuben to wrap Kristen's body in his bedsheets and then carried her through the bedroom window before placing her on the back of Paul's truck. Reuben then drove back to Arroyo Grande, where he hid Kristen's body while Paul stayed behind. He took a shower, cleaned his room, withdrew money from an ATM, and bought tickets for a movie that night, creating an alibi. That Sunday morning, he called Reuben from his dorm room and left campus carrying a bag that Reuben claimed contained laundry. He supposedly spent most of the day working on his truck, and that night, he's arrested by the Arroyo Grande police for breaking his probation after failing to appear for a DUI charge, and he loses his driver's license. The photo they take of him that night is the only record of his black eye. Reuben posts bail for him that night, and that Monday, Susan comments on his black eye, and Paul tells her that he doesn't know where he got it from, and Reuben says that he got it while removing the stereo from his truck, a story they later stick to. Chris theorizes that Reuben, and not Kristen, had punched Paul as punishment for killing Kristen. While Chris speculates that Susan didn't know what Paul had done until at least a month later, Susan, Reuben, Irma Linda, and her boyfriend at the time, Brett, had allegedly assisted Paul in escaping justice. The only question was, where did they bury her? Now, if you live in a small community, you're probably familiar with old ladies and their propensity to stare out of windows at passers-by. <laughs> I'm not, but it's like, it's such a movie trope that it's like, there's always some old woman watching. <laughs> 
My husband jokingly refers to them as meerkats because they're always watching and miss nothing, and they were crucial to cracking the case wide open. Because both Susan and Ruben are, to put it mildly, hated in their community, both Chris Lambert and Sheriff's Office had no shortage of spies. And just days after the first raids took place in February 2020, some of Ruben's neighbors notified both Chris and the Sheriff's Office that something fishy was going on. One neighbor reported that around the 7th and 8th of February 2020, Susan Flores, her boyfriend Mike McConville, and Ruben Flores could be heard arguing through out the night. Another neighbor reported that Ruben Flores had removed a fence that blocked access to his backyard and that Mike McConville's truck and his trailer had been parked next to the deck all weekend, blocking their view of the deck. And in Your Own Backyard, Chris had also mentioned several times that Ruben Flores was suspiciously protective when it came to his deck and the backyard. The White Court House was built on a piece of land that had once been part of an avocado orchard. The house had been built on a steep slope, and in some places the crawl space underneath the house was easily eight feet high. A deck had been built at the back of the house, and the sides of the deck were enclosed with lattice, creating a storage space underneath the house that could be accessed via a side door. A plumber, who'd once worked on Reuben's house, had contacted Chris and told him that he'd once been called out to fix a toilet in the house. When he told Reuben that he'd have to dig underneath the house to fix the problem, Reuben chased him away and told him that he'd fix the problem himself. A man who'd once rented a room in the house told Chris that he'd once stored empty barrels underneath the house. When Reuben found out about it, he lost his shit and banned the guy from ever entering the crawl space again. And Paul's one and only ex-girlfriend had told Chris that while visiting Paul's father at the White Court house, she'd admired the avocado orchard and wanted to explore further. When she made to enter the backyard, Paul and Reuben urged her to go back to the front of the house. At the time, she thought it was odd, but after they broke up, she found that Paul was a suspect in Kristen's disappearance, and then she became convinced that Kristen was buried in the avocado orchard. And an ex-roommate had called in a tip, explaining that Paul had told her once that Kristen was buried underneath a structure in his parents' yard, and that the stupid police had been standing on top of her, but hadn't found her. <laughs> what are you doing? Just telling people about your crimes? What the f***? And why didn't this person come forward? Chris was able to provide the sheriff's office with all of their names and contact numbers, and it gave Detective Cole the motivation he needed to obtain a search warrant for Reuben Flores' house. I fucking love this, um, what's it called? Like, individual journalism? Not that, like, um, ah, it's like a mix between journalism and vigilanteism and all this stuff where just regular people are like, yeah, that crime, I'm gonna fucking solve that shit. Chris, legend of this story. On the 15th of March 2021, Ruben Flores was handed a copy of the search warrant and was ordered to leave the property for the entire duration of the search. Forensic vans, archaeologists, cadaver dogs, and GPR search teams descended onto the property, pitched a forensics tent, and for the remainder of the day they searched the backyard and the avocado grove. Reuben had fled to Susan's house, and he, Susan, and Mike would take turns to drive past the property all day, mockingly waving at their neighbors, the press, Chris Lambert, and the police as if they knew the police wouldn't find anything. But they did. At around 6 p.m. that evening, Chris Lambert watched on as a bunch of detectives entered the space underneath the house and started carrying buckets of soil into the tent. The soil was sent off for testing and would later come back as having tested positive for human blood. In a statement issued to the media, the sheriff's office would later explain that they'd found evidence of a human burial site. They also found proof that the body had been dug up and removed, and a luminol test indicated that it had been transported using Mike McConville's trailer, which was still parked on the property. Mike McConville, what are you doing? You're just the new husband of the ex-wife, the new boyfriend of the ex-wife. Why are you getting involved in this shit? Jesus Christ. Traces of red, grey, and black fibres that were consistent with the type of clothing that Kristen had been wearing that night were found in the soil, and it was enough circumstantial evidence for them to conclude that Kristen Smart had, up until February 2020, been buried underneath Ruben Flores' house. People on Flores On the 13th of April 2021, 44-year-old Paul Flores was arrested for first-degree murder while in the commission of the attempted rape of Kristen Denise Smart. Reuben Flores, who just turned eight, he was arrested that same morning for being an accessory after the fact. Their trial was originally scheduled to begin on the 25th of April 2022, but the defense requested a change of venue and argued that the Arroyo Grande community was too prejudiced against Paul and Reuben. He rightly claimed that they wouldn't receive a fair trial, so it was moved to Monterey County's courthouse in Salinas, California, where Judge Jennifer O'Keefe would hear the case. I think that's totally fine. I, I absolutely wouldn't get a fair trial in the local area because they would be like, strap him to the chair, strap him to the chair, because he's a f***ing monster. 
Because they'd been charged with two different crimes that overlapped, both Paul and Reuben each had their own jury. This meant that if any evidence was presented that implicated Paul but not Reuben, Reuben's jury was required to leave the courtroom and vice versa. The court had also ordered that no cameras or recording equipment would be allowed into the courtroom, and this meant that the media and Chris Lambert had to sit and make handwritten notes for the entire duration of the trial. Their trial started on the 18th of July, 2022, and Assistant DA Chris Pruvrell started his opening statement by saying 1,359. That's the number of Sundays that have passed since Kristen Smart last spoke to her family. He outlined the state's case explaining the theory of what had happened that night. He went on to explain that several witnesses would testify that it wasn't the first time that Kristen had met Paul. In fact, he'd been stalking her for weeks beforehand, he used to lurk around in Moore Hall, and had confronted Kristen in her dorm room on numerous occasions. He continued to explain that several people would testify that they hadn't seen Kristen drink anything that night, that Paul had been hovering around her, and that within an hour of arriving at the party, Kristen seemed to be heavily intoxicated. He explains that Paul had already got a history of intoxicated women and that it wasn't a leap to assume that as soon as he had Kristen alone, Paul had tried to assault her as well, killing her in the process. His theory regarding what happened to Kristen's body mirrors Chris's theory, and he explains that for the next 24 years, Ruben Flores had done his best to conceal his son's crimes, going so far as to dig up the body and move it once he realized that the police were closing in on them, and that when Ruben, Susan, and Mike were providing DNA for a test back in 2021, Reuben and asked Detective Cole, why are you taking their DNA? They didn't commit a felony. Only I did. That's a stupid thing to say. <laughs> Paul's defense attorney, Robert Sanger, explained to the court that no one knew what happened to Kristen Smart and that the sheriff's office didn't have any evidence to explain what had happened to her. Quote, the fact is, there's a lot of sort of evidence. Sanger went on to explain that Kristen hadn't been the sweet ray of sunshine that the smart family and the media made her out to be. She hadn't been happy at Cal Poly, had engaged in at-risk behavior, got wasted at a party, and had then most likely run away. Paul's sex life had nothing to do with her disappearance. He then argued that the entire case against Paul was one big, gigantic conspiracy theory, and that the DA's office, the sheriff's office, the smarts, the podcaster, and the entirety of Arroyo Grande had it in for his clients, and the so-called evidence they had consisted of nothing more than junk science. Ruben's attorney, defense attorney Harold Messick, told the court that for almost 26 years, Ruben Flores had been terrorized by the smart family, the media, and his community. Police detectives, wonder dogs, and psychics had torn up every inch of his house and yard, and hadn't been able to find a shred of evidence to prove that it had anything to do with Kristen's disappearance. Well, they found the remains of, like, human blood. And why are you talking about psychics? This doesn't seem like a very good defense. Messick invited the jury to make note of the evidence that the prosecution had to prove that Reuben was in fact guilty, and that, quote, at the end, if you have an empty notebook, I'll ask you to return a not guilty verdict. Imagine the uh, the, the other lawyer, the prosecutor's, going to be quite quickly filling up that notebook, isn't he? For the next 10 weeks, the court heard the testimonies of the Cal Poly witnesses, Kristen's friends, the dog handlers who'd searched Paul's room, and the experts who'd conducted a search of Reuben's yard. They watched interrogation tapes, watched as both Paul and Reuben lied to the police, and heard how Paul explained in June 1996 that after they had returned to the dorm that night, he'd taken a shower because he'd been covered in vomit. Messick didn't do much but joke with the witnesses throughout the trial, and Sanger bumbled about making self-deprecating jokes when he explained that D.A. Peruveral had a fancy logo on his laptop's desktop backgrounds, and he didn't. What? This, this guy seems like a pretty bad lawyer. This guy doesn't seem like <laughs> a great lawyer, in my opinion. <laughs> Be like, oh no, this guy? I don't want this guy! Sanger indicated that GPR experts weren't experts because they didn't have PhDs. The dog handlers were just volunteers, and even though they were doing honorable work, their opinions couldn't be trusted since they were all in a club and didn't work independently. He scoffed at the results of soil tests done to determine that Kristen had indeed been buried underneath Reuben's deck, and then produced an expert who did have a PhD but had never performed a soil test in her life. She had to call an expert in Germany in order to form an opinion on the viability of the test. This is just nonsense. It's a nonsense defense. My favorite part was when Sanger implied that the cadaver dogs were all friends and that their handlers had conspired together to indicate the presence of a decomposing body in Paul's room. <laughs> what motivation could they possibly have? 
And because Detective Cole and Pooverell wore purple ties in honor of Kristen, it was proof that they and the podcast were all part of the conspiracy aimed at destroying Paul Flores' reputation. Chris, the prosecution, the jury, the public, and I all thought that Sanger was an idiot, but the media hailed Pooverell as a hero. He'd later admit to Chris Lambert that he'd followed Chris's live tweets of the case and had read the comments about the case and then did his best to answer the public's questions whenever he called a witness to testify. In his closing argument, Sanger once again argued that the case was all a big conspiracy theory, and then blamed Kristen for what had happened that night by explaining that if she hadn't made a habit of getting into cars with boys, if she hadn't gotten drunk, and if she hadn't been dressed the way she was, uh, she wouldn't have been targeted that night. Bro, that is not... <laughs> oh my god, if I was sitting in the dark being defended by this guy, I'd be like, oh, fuck. Fuck! Kristen did nothing wrong by wanting to go out that night. She did nothing wrong by wearing a crop top and blackboard shorts. She did nothing wrong by wanting to enjoy the party. It was Paul who'd done wrong by stalking her, who drugged her, forced himself on her, dragged her into his bedroom, and then killed her. On the 18th of October 2022, both juries came back with their verdicts. Ruben Flores was found not guilty and free to go. Paul, however, was found guilty of first-degree murder and was sentenced to 25 years to life in prison. Excellent. Too short. Life is how long without parole. And also, the fact that you've been walking around for God knows how many Sundays free is like, yeah, f Yeah. Yeah. F you. I'm glad you're in prison, you dick. Your own backyard. On the 18th of October 2023, Chris released an episode titled Closer to Closure, a conversation with the Smart family, in which he explains that nothing had turned out the way it expected. He expected to publish six episodes and be done with Kristen Smart. Instead, he was able to achieve his goal of finding justice for her. Chris seems far too humble to admit it, but Assistant DA Chris Pulverell, Detective Clint Cole, Sheriff Ian Parkinson, and the Smart family have all said that if it hadn't been for Chris Lambert, Paul wouldn't be in prison today. I f***ing agree. Chris Lambert's a legend. Thank you, Chris. I'm going to listen to your podcast as well. It sounds awesome. The Smarts explain that their victory over the Flores family is bittersweet. Even though they're happy that Paul can't hurt anybody else anymore, they still don't know where Kristen's body ended up. But they insist that they won't go up until they found Kristen. Their only wish is that the kids won't have to continue to carry the burden of their sister's loss once they're gone. Until then, they ask that if anyone in the Aurora Grande area happened to see where either Reuben, Susan, or Mike McConville drove to over the weekend of the 7th and 8th of February 2020, they should please contract the San Luis Obispo County Sheriff's Office and help them finally put Kristen to rest. Why is Susan and Mike McConville? Why are they doing... Didn't they get... There's no trouble for them. And why was Reuben not guilty? Bro, these people also deserve to be in trouble, in my opinion, allegedly. Dismembered Appendices Number 1. Following Kristen's disappearance, the Kristen Smart Campus Security Act was passed that requires campus police to involve law enforcement in any criminal investigations right away. Wait, are campus police not law enforcement? They're called campus police. I assume this was like not just security guards, but like an actual police station that would exist on a large university campus. But apparently not. Number 2. A case was opened by the LAPD to investigate the number of sexual assaults that Paul had committed, but they had trouble locating the women in the photos, lessening their chances of building a strong case against him. However, according to Detective Cole, those photos will form a part of Paul's file when he's up for parole in 15 years. 25 years to life? Why is he up for parole in 15 years? No! 15 years is not enough. Dude, he had pictures of women he had sexually assaulted. And when the kids on his computer and he murdered someone, what the f 15 years and then possible parole? He better stay in prison. He better f stay in prison. Number three. According to an article published by Vanity Fair in January 2023, your own backyard has been downloaded over 24 million times. Holy sh. For those of you not in the, like, knowing about podcasts and stuff, that is a lot of downloads. I definitely recommend it, since I found it extremely satisfying that when Chris interviewed Detective Cole in episode 7, he still had no idea they were on the brink of solving the case, and that it's really, really good. Number 4. On the day of sentencing, all of the media representatives held a mini-ceremony and granted Chris Lambert the number one media tag to honor his efforts in finding justice for Kristen. Number 5. 
After the trial, Chris met with some of the jury members who'd convicted Paul Flores. They'd all listened to his podcast, and they told Chris that they'd often felt left out during the trial because the attorneys often referred to the podcast, but they weren't allowed to listen to it. After listening to it, however, they feel that important evidence had been left out of the trial, but they feel more confident in the knowledge that they'd done the right thing by finding Paul guilty. Number 6. One of Rubin's jury members was let go shortly before the jury returned a not guilty verdict. According to the jury member, he'd mentioned his struggle with the case to his priest, which isn't allowed. Later, one of the old other jury members explained that they'd been in the process of convincing the others that Rubin was indeed guilty. If he'd been allowed to stay, it's possible that Rubin Flores would have been found guilty instead. Yeah, why wasn't he found guilty? I mean, I, I, I'd have voted guilty for him, for sure. Number 7. John Murphy and his law firm assisted the Smart family in their fight for justice for Kristen for over 25 years. All of it pro bono. Legends. Respect. Number 8. From 2000 onwards, Paul's attorney met with John Murphy on numerous occasions to discuss possible deals in exchange for the location of Kristen's body, including involuntary manslaughter. Apparently, Paul wanted to get away with just a slap on the wrist, but the Smarts insisted that he pay for what he did to their daughter. Yeah, you can't tell me involuntary manslaughter! <laughs> Come on! In return, they might have lost the opportunity to finally bring her home. Yeah, well, I'd rather he be in prison forever than them have the body, to be honest, because f him, keep him in prison forever, as long as possible. Number 9. Denise Smart refers to Chris Lambert as her fourth child, and he's officially been adopted into the Smart family. God damn, that's awesome! <laughs> Number 10. In Your Own Backyard, Chris explains that the Cal Poly faculty had failed Kristen after she didn't show up for her final exams. In 2020, students at Cal Poly started a petition and got Cal Poly to rectify their mistake. Number 11. Stan and Denise established the Kristen Smart Scholarship Fund in order to help young women reach for their dreams. It's entirely funded by public donations, and if you'd like to contribute, you can find all the necessary information on their website at kristensmart.org. Number 12. And lastly, this case was listed as for writing when I started working with Simon. So I guess thank you to Simon for recommending me the case. Oh, you're welcome. <laughs> I, did, I don't even remember this, but I guess so. It's a long time ago. And that's where we end today's episode. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, I won't ask you whether you enjoyed it because it's horrible. But good news, that f*** is prison, hopefully forever. And uh, thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. And I'll see you next time.